The Contradictions of Capital Mobility. This is a video about some things I discovered over the course of many years doing simulations of capitalist economies using Marx's reproduction schemes. And on the, the question of capital mobility, the orthodox view in economics is that profit rates across industries should equalise and do equalise, and this is a good thing. The prominent economist Samuelson, who run, wrote one of the main textbooks, widely used textbooks of economics, may, made this tendency of the profit rate to equalise the foundation of his attack on the labour theory of value. In this, he was helped by some Marxist economists who should have known better, like uh, Steedman, who was my undergrad tutor. The essence of Steedman and Samuelson's argument was that if you construct a set of equations for prices that assume profit equalization, then labor values become irrelevant. You don't need to transform values into prices of production. Instead, all you can need to do is look at the technical structure of production and the real income of workers. And from this, there's only one set of prices and profits that are possible. Now, this is all subject to the assumption of profit rate equalization. And if labor values are redundant, theoretically redundant, and it are irrelevant for real world prices, then they become relegated to the field of morals and moral philosophy. There wouldn't be a valid economic theory anymore. And the attractions of this for orthodox economics are self-evident. They're only able to do this because in volume three of Capital, Marx made what will subsequently turn out to be a fatal concession to a bourgeois view of the world by assuming also that profit rates do equalise. Samuelson and Steedman were thus able to claim that they discredited Marxian economics using Marx's own statements by revealing internal contradictions in what Marx has said. But it's a dogma. Profit rate equalisation was never more than a dogma. It's one of those things that Marx called an illusion of competition. Of course, to a banker or stockbroker, it's self-evident that profit rates equalise or rates of return equalise. Why is this? Suppose, let's take the example of bonds. Suppose the government issues a bond for $1,000 when the rate of interest is 5%. Well, this bond's going to give you $50 interest a year. If the rate of interest falls to 4%, this bond will sell on the exchange for $1,250. Since any rentier with $1,000 would far rather buy the, the bond than leave their money in the bank getting only 4%. Uh, this means the bond price will rise until the return on the bond is the same as the interest in the bank. That is the form of mobility of capital that stockbrokers are familiar with. And it happens very fast. If the rate of interest rises, the price of government bonds falls, which is the inverse process, and that's been happening recently. A lot of bonds were issued when the rate of interest was only 1% or so, and if the rate of interest has risen to 4%, then these become worth a lot less. And last week's failure of the Silicon Valley Bank was due to this. Their reserves were held in bonds whose notional value collapsed when the Fed raised interest rates. Now, the examples I'm giving, I'm assuming perpetual bonds, bonds which whose um, original capital is never paid back. Uh, so once, if the original capital is paid back, the, the calculations become a bit more difficult. A similar process occurs with share prices. If a share is expected to pay a dividend of £50 at the end of the year, the rational price under a 4% interest rate for the share is $1,250. Now, in case of shares, there are additional complications for risk and speculation, but the basic principle that the price 
is inversely related to the interest rate or inversely related to the rate of return. The average rate of return is understood by all rentier. So when the interest rate falls, the stock market rises. That's well established that this happens. But stocks aren't capital. They only appear to be capital to the rentier class. They're just pieces of paper. They're not products of labour and don't have any real value. All they've got is a speculative price, and that speculative price can change in an instant. Because of this, it's invalid to take the common sense view of the banker or speculator and assume it applies to real capital, to real products of labour like railway lines, power stations, oil tankers, etc. Empirically, the opposite holds. Profit rates don't equalise and capital intensive industries have low rates of profit as stipulated by the law of value. So if, if you take the USA, this is a graph we published on the occasion of Marx's 100th anniversary of uh, Volume 3 of Capital being published. Uh, it appeared under the, the title, Does Marx Need to Transform? And what we've done here is plot the organic composition of capital on the x-axis, the rate of return on capital for an industry on the y-axis, and this is for the US in some, some year in the 1980s, I think it was 1987, and you see the actual data points are clustered around this curve. Now that curve is the curve which describes the rate of profit that would be predicted in terms of volume one of capital. So we can see that Marx's uh, concession to the banker's world view was wrong. He didn't need to make this concession. Uh, the basic relationship we showed there has been replicated by other Marxist economists for other countries. So we can take it as, as pretty pretty well established now. When we first published this, we got from other economists uh, the, the question, but why don't profit rates equalise? Because they had such a great just-so story to explain why they must equalise. And I'll give you the story as it, in a stylized way as it was presented to me in my undergraduate economics classes. Suppose the Spargel industry has a low organic composition of capital and consequently a high rate of profit. What happens is that capitalists everywhere withdraw their capital from whatever they were doing and rush to produce Spargels. The oversupply of Spargels makes their price fall until Spargel firms just make the average profit. And hence, by generalization, if we apply this across the whole economy, the rate of profit will tend towards a single average rate of profit. But we know there's just a load of old asparagus, because profit rates don't actually equalize. And as I go on, I'm going to explain why it's illusions about capital, and that there are contradictions inherent in the story once you flesh it out. Later on, perhaps in another video, I'll illustrate the simulation models which show this. Now, on the illusions about capital, I said before, a banker thinks capital is just value, which can be moved about at will. You hear trash being spoken about how capital moves at the electronic speeds from country to country, but it doesn't. Real capital is physical stuff, and it has specific uses. You can't repurpose an oil tanker to grow asparagus. And once you've invested in tankers, somebody is stuck with tankers. A individual tanker owner may sell a ship to buy a vegetable farm or lots of vegetable farms, but that's just a change in personal ownership. The shipbuilder's labor is still fixed in the form of a tanker. The tanker doesn't turn into a vegetable farm. I'm now gonna look at the internal contradictions of the story. And what these economists forget is that Marx's analysis focuses on the conflict between labor and capital. And he has a theory about how the reserve army of labor, the unemployed, 
development level, regulates the level of exploitation. And Steedman's fable ignored this. He assumed that the level of real wages would be unchanged by the transformation from values to prices of production. He's quite evidently wrong on this. As soon as you analyse the mechanism that he proposes, you can see what trash that argument is. Now, Monk said, and the evidence backs him up, that high levels of unemployment depress wages and increase exploitation. Conversely, low unemployment allows wages to increase. And you can model it with a curve like this. Marx assumes a equilibrium range wage share, that is to say 50% of value added goes to workers, 50% to capitalists. He assumes this in all his examples. And the basis of the theory of the reserve army of labour is that there's an equilibrium level of unemployment which sustains this level of e exploitation. The orthodox economics calls this the Nairu, the non-inflationary rate of unemployment. That is to say the rate at which exploitation can be stabilised. You've got to realise that when bankers and capitalists talk about the danger of inflation, what they really mean is the danger that the level of exploitation will fall. <coughs> and the term used for this curve, this shape of curve and this sort of curve is a Phillips curve because he was the economist who in the 1950s collected a lot of historical data on rates of unemployment and wage movements and showed that they fitted a curve of this general shape. Now, you may ask, what's this got to do with profit rate equalization? Well, let's follow the first contradiction in Stevens' argument. Suppose the tanker industry has 900 million in constant capital for every 100 million in variable capital. So for each billion invested there, 900 million is constant capital. Now, oh, we're not making enough money in this. We'll turn all our tankers into vegetable farms. Suppose that really was possible. They end up with 1,000 million in vegetable farms. And this then gets split in a different ratio. 600 million variable 400 million constant. But when you do that, the demand for labour power has risen. It's gone up by 500 million. And the demand for machinery has fallen. Now, what's the effect of this on the rest of the economy? This movement from high organic composition to low organic composition industries, which is Steedman's mechanism, this is going to increase the number of workers employed. Demand for labour goes up. Wages will rise and exploitation would fall. Thus, the mean rate of profit for the economy must fall as well. So the basic assumption that transformation from values to prices of production is possible without a change in the rate of exploitation is wrong. Were it really to occur on a large scale, were there really to be an outflow of capital from industries with a high organic composition of capital to those with a low organic composition of capital, there would be an enormous increase in the demand for labour power and there'd be a crisis in the bargaining power of capital versus labour. The next contradiction relates to which industries have the high organic composition of capital. I first looked at the reserve army of labour. I'm now going to look at the implications this has for simple reproduction and how, if what Steedman claimed was true, and all Kleeman claims it as well, if what these people claim was true, how the process they claim of capital mobility would necessarily lead to the decline of Department 1. And economic uh, stagnation and collapse. Now this is a, a table I've used in many lectures before, both on the reproduction schemes and on inflation and Marx's um, book Wage, Labour and Capital, 
wages, prices and profit. Um, if you look at this, Department 1, which produces means of production, has a high organic composition of capital. Two units of constant capital for every unit of variable capital. The consumer goods industries, Department 2, have a low organic composition of capital. One unit of constant capital for every two units of wages. This would mean that the rate of profit in the consumer goods industry is going to be higher. Now this is a realistic assumption. It requires a lot of constant capital usually to make means of production. Now you can show my simulation that if capital moves from department 1 to department 2, the short term effect is what I described earlier to increase the demand for labour and to raise wages. But in the longer term, the output of Department 1 falls to it's no longer sufficient to meet the supply needs of Department 2. Now, in the short run, this doesn't matter because the decline in demand for Department 1 means that there's excess stock which can be used up for a few, for a, a period of time, would I say it's years, a period of time in Department 2. But in the longer term, the shortage of raw materials from Department 1 forces capitalists in Department 2 to lay off workers, resulting in mass unemployment. And this is a process that you can see happening relatively recently due to the supply chain interruptions that occurred during COVID when certain key means of production such as microprocessor chips for cars became unavailable and car manufacturers across Europe laid off car workers because they couldn't get certain key means of production. Now what happens then is that the economy goes into a recession. You get high unemployment, briefly you get low unemployment, then you get high unemployment. The effect of the high unemployment is to increase exploitation and a simple bit of algebra will easily convince you that if it's a high rate of exploitation then the profit rate difference between high and low organic composition of capitals gets greater. And this accentuates the positive feedback. It accentuates the incentive to move capital out of Department 1 and into Department 2. So the economic decline would accelerate. When I was writing the book How the World Works, I simulated a large sample of different randomly selected feasible reproduction schemes under conditions of textbook capital mobility. And I found that a large proportion of economies simply collapse under the capital mobility assumptions. And when I did averages of the organic composition of capital of those which tended to collapse, they're the ones with high organic composition of capital in Department 1. Now, this revealed to me something which I had not understood when I first did it. The first time I tried doing simulations of capitalist economies using input-output tables, capital mobility and Serafian Steedman prices of production was just after I graduated in economics and shortly after that I did a computing degree and did as my dissertation a Steedman style simulation of capitalist economies using a fairly detailed input-output table. And I found it was extremely difficult to prevent the whole thing collapsing. And I found the same thing again 20 years later in the 1990s when I was over staying with Alan Cottrell in America and we tried doing these simulations. The textbook assumptions lead very often to a collapse. And when I looked at why it was happening, what tended to happen was that the some key industry like the steel industry or the coal industry kept reducing its output and all the other sectors because they depended on it cut their output too and the whole thing went into a tailspin. 
it's because of this mechanism now. I've only really understood it by running the simulation step by step and inspecting what happens. The process is what I've just described. Now, does this affect the real world? We know that in the real world rates of return are dispersed, so we know a priori that the the Steedman theory is wrong. Steedman Samuelson theory is wrong. It doesn't work for a stably surviving capitalist economy. But on the other hand, the neoliberal economists thought that any dispersion of profit rates is a bad thing and everything possible should be done to encourage capital mobility. Now, the analysis I've just presented suggests that in any economy where C over V is highest in Department 1. These neoliberal policies of encouraging capital mobility will lead to an irreversible trajectory of economic decline as Department 1 collapses. And arguably we've seen that in several countries. The first place we saw it was in the Soviet Union when it became capitalist Russia and capitalist Ukraine etc. And instead of Department 1 being planned by the state, the Yeltsin government believed that if we leave capital mobility to seek the highest rate of return, the economy will pr prosper. Nonsense. What happened was means of production sector collapsed. S Lots of factories producing means of production were closed down. Some of them turned over into things like shopping malls. And the end result was a much weaker economy with a much lower output. And it's arguably the same thing's happening in the USA. You've all seen photos of the derelict state of a lot of factories that were once the heart of the US industrial economy. Neoliberal policies if they attempt to apply this policy of equalization of profit rates actually lead to catastrophe. 